And good afternoon, everyone. My name's Jennifer Walenga. I'm a professor in the School of Communication and Culture at Royal Roads University. And welcome to episode 22 of our webinar series on sport, leadership, and social change. We're excited to welcome panelists who are here to talk about excellence in community sport and the kinds of values and principles that community sport can model and teach us, especially in a time when our sport system is wrestling with a number of challenges. So we'll get to our panelists shortly. I always want to first start by acknowledging the land that I'm operating on and that our campus operates on as well. We're on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen and Quisetsun First Nations. We also call our partners uh, Songhees and Esquimalt peoples. Uh, it's really important here at Royal Roads to acknowledge our history. We are on a beautiful 300 hectares of un, un, uh, untouched forests, and we're staring out at the Olympic Mountains and the, and the Harrow Strait. And it's crucial that we acknowledge our history and that these lands are not ours, they are unseated. It's important to acknowledge some of the harms that colonialism and imperialism inflicted on these people. And uh, in many of the same ways that we're struggling in sport to acknowledge the truth and the harms that have occurred in order to hold people accountable, hold ourselves accountable, and even if we're not responsible, to take responsibility for preventing these harms from ever happening again, making the changes that are necessary. And so today is particularly valuable for me because we can look to uh, some fantastic models of community sport that are happening across our country and look to them and, and, and ponder them, like seriously ponder them and think about how can we ensure that we protect the, the young people entering the sports system today. We try to learn from the land as well. It's important to think about diversity, equity, access. Uh, this is what the land teaches us daily at Royal Roads. And we're so lucky to just look out our window and be taught about ecological systems that we can then apply to our our human functions and our organizations as well. This bridge is the model for our School of Communication and Culture, and it highlights for us how important it is to first mine the gap before we try to bridge the gap, embrace diversity, understand differences before we try to build connections between one another, whether it's a handshake, a conversation, or a, an actual physical structure or process. At Royal Roads, we uh, really value three key concepts in our learning, teaching, and research model, being applied and authentic, very real. Our learners uh, are often invited to turn what they've learned and researched and discovered into something that can help others. It's all operating within a, a community-based model of caring. We value care. And our goal is to, is life.changing, is to transform lives uh, so that people who've gone through transformational learning can then help others, serve others in that process as well toward positive change in our world. And here we are thinking about sport, and I really believe this increasingly as I get older, that true, sport really offers some of the more most important principles to our world. There's so much truth in sport. Uh, sure, we're seeing some of the worst evidence of sport lately, but it still possesses principles. Sport hasn't changed. Sport has so many wonderful values to share, teach, offer. Uh, and it's such a beautiful vehicle through which we can learn. This is me and my skinny little boat on the Wasanish territories being taught every single day about balance and precision, patience and discipline. And we know the power of sport. We've seen it. We've seen it used as a platform for change uh, over the years, for many years, many decades, by so many of our uh, leaders within sport, whether they're athletes, fans, officials, coaches, leaders, uh, who've taken that platform and really spoken for positive change in our society. Our programs here at Royal Roads are very interdisciplinary and in many of the same ways try to speak the values of development, diversity, inclusion, education, the sustainable environments, equity, human rights, health, communication, and peace. And we have lots of partnerships here at Rural Roads. It's not really a varsity sport type of or, uh, institution, but we definitely have partnerships with sport because we believe in honoring the experience and the learning that people gain through their professional careers, whether those are in the public sector, private sector, or sports sector. We also offer some programming in sport that again reflects our themes, our core themes and pillars at the university, but also 
uh, acknowledge the need that we're hearing in sport for leadership, governance, and, uh, and citizenship, leadership development. And so here we are with episode 22, excellence in community sport. You know, we talk a lot about excellence in high performance sport, but excellence can happen anywhere in the sport environment. Uh, we want everyone who participates in sport to have an excellent experience. And we are all partners in creating those, uh, ex that excellence across our, our landscape. So what are the measures of excellence within community sport and how can we apply those in every, every corner of our sport uh, system in Canada? What are some great examples of positive experiences, excellent experiences across our community sport realm? And welcome to all of our attendees. Uh, so great to always see so many. We're kind of marveling at how we were able to sustain quite a high number of attendance uh, in terms of attendance at these webinars after so much Zooming. Uh, but it's great. And I think uh, I was sharing with the panel that I think it's because we just really love sport. We care about it so much. And we're all working very hard to try to rescue it from some of its pitfalls and also uh, embrace all the qualities that we love so much about it. So let's start with uh, an introduction. Sorry, I've got my timing off a little there. Carrie Dawson. Welcome, Carrie Dawson. She's the Executive Director of Values-Based Sport at the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport, CCES. You've probably seen that before. And a driving force for True Sport. True Sport is a national social engagement campaign designed to ensure that good sport, quality sport, values-based sport, instills character in kids, strengthens communities, and increases opportunities for organizational and sporting excellence. That, you know, those models that we can learn from in and wherever we're operating within sport. Welcome to Katie Meisner. And uh, Katie and I met at a symposium face-to-face -face finally. Uh, Katie's an associate professor at the University of Waterloo, and she's researching the capacity and social impact of nonprofit community sport organizations. Her particular focus is on how capacity can be enhanced to support sport service delivery and foster social engagement through sport through sport. We've used that quite a few times in our titles of these web webinar uh, episodes. In sport, we can learn things. Through sport, we can learn things. Sport can be a vehicle for teaching. And welcome to Haley Baxter. That's Katie Meisner's uh, doctoral student. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo as well, and a hockey coach investigating the experiences of women and girls as volunteers in the community sport context. Her particular focus she wants to tackle are the troubling statistics of female underrepresentation in leadership roles and the lack of organizational support that I know the Canadian soccer team is currently uh, really trying to change in community sport organizations, but uh, we need to change that across our sport landscape. I want to remind our participants, welcome Jill Werflinger, good to see you here, uh, that they can pose questions in the chat or by using your mic. If you just turn your mic on, we can, I watch for it, I can tell, or if you want to put your hand up using the reactions, you're welcome to speak in this forum. It's, it's quite a discussion really by the end. You can also pose your questions in the chat and we'll, we're monitoring them, we'll get to them. And I, especially as I notice as they start to weave into a theme we might be tackling at the moment, then I'll bring you in and you're welcome to speak or we can just read your question in the chat. I also want to highlight that uh, we've got some contact information for everyone. So if you want to follow us on our various social media channels, there they are. And we have another episode, of course, coming up in March. March 22nd is our date, and we'll be welcoming five grad students, current, past, future, <laughs> uh, who are, you know, my team of cats, really, that I try to corral and, and get working in different areas of sport. They're all fantastic champions of sport and young leaders. So I, I encourage you to come and attend and hear what they have to say about the work, the amazing work and the amazing impact they're having, especially when we link arms, right? We're a powerful, powerful, powerful group. All right, well, thank you very much. I'll stop there. And I'd like to uh, begin by welcoming our panelists. And I always start by asking each of our panelists for a little more of an introduction to them so we can get to know them personally and professionally, but in particular through the lens of sport. So describe from, you know, briefly, but you can talk, take as much time as you want. We've got an hour and a half. Share your journey to sport. Why are you still in sport? Why is it so important to you? You know, all three of you have really devoted your life to, uh, to supporting this concept of sport. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Anybody like to start? Just turn your mic on. I'll... Go ahead, Carrie. Thank you. Okay. 
Sure, I'll go first. Um, thanks so much for inviting me here uh, today, Jennifer. Super happy to be part of this conversation. Um, so my journey of sports started when I was very, very young. I don't come from a family of high performance athletes, but I certainly come from a family that believe uh, in being connected to our community and sport was a great way to do that. So I grew up on a farm in rural Eastern Ontario. So pretty much played on every sport in every season because there was only that many kids available to play is kind of how it worked out. Um, so met a lot of lifelong friends through sport. When I became a parent, my two children, it was a similar scenario. You know, you need to get out there. You need to get involved. We'll start with individual sports, get your physical literacy. We'll move to team sports when you're old enough for that. And so traveled through sport as a parent and, and a volunteer, um, trainer, manager, whatever you needed kind of thing. And then I've now spent the last 25 years basically working in sport. So always at the national level, but I've always been involved in um, a sport really around kind of the fundamentals of access, inclusion, ensuring a values-based experience, focusing on fun and just sort of all those life lessons that I learned from sport that I think other people should learn from sport. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of work that I've always done. And, and I think the reason why I stay in sport is because I think sport is a fabulous uh, public asset um, and it needs passionate people. It needs well-intentioned people to, you know, to guide it, to nurture it, to shepherd it. So I think that it's just got this tremendous value um, and that we need to, we need to cherish it. So that's why I stay and that's why I do the work that I do. We're so appreciative of the work that you do. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks for that little glimpse into your life. I want to pick up threads from there and, and help, help me remember everybody, you know, the idea of a small town. And I think there's a real nugget in there that uh, there's only us. So we have to step up and be the team, right? That's really cool. Public asset, beautifully described. And, uh, and old enough for team sport. Well, we'll circle back to that one for sure. Katie Meisner, you're up next. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Lots of synergies there. Um, and thanks, Jen, for inviting us. This is an amazing um, group of people. And, and this I'm reading this list, recognizing a few names from uh, lots of different connections. So that's fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Um, so my, my sort of story of sport, um, I often share with students, too, because you know, I think, I think where we come from, it's a, it's a great way to open because it really sets the stage for, for why we care at the end of the day. Um, I was an athlete myself. I was a gymnast growing up and a swimmer. I played baseball. I sort of did lots of different sports, um, gymnastics and dance at a fairly high level. And, um, my parents were really involved. My brother played rep hockey. My sister was involved in gymnastics and my parents volunteered a lot. They gave a lot of time, um, to our sport, not just driving us, but also volunteering within the organizations on the board and that sort of thing. So it was really modeled to me, um, at a very young age, what it looks like to be sort of a family that's involved in sport and lots of other community um, things as well. But sport was definitely a huge part of our, our family life. Um, and then I went on and did an undergrad in kinesiology and really sort of loved more the administrative side of sport and how do we make our systems and our structures and our organizations as robust as they can be. So I sort of carried on in the field is called sport management, um, the academic discipline and did my master's in sport management and my PhD as well, um, focused on the community sport context, because that's where I had had the most experience. I wasn't, you know, an elite athlete per se, um, but I was a dedicated athlete and uh, had seen the impact in my own family. So Community sport is the place where I dedicate all of my professional time um, in my research hat. Um, and it's also now the, the space that I spend a lot of time with my own kids who are 11 and 9 um, and who are athletes themselves. And as a family, we spend a lot of time with our community sport clubs. And I'm a team manager right now. Haley calls me the momager. <laughs> um, but uh, as Carrie said, you know, when you volunteer and when you step up to those roles, whether coaching or managing or anything else, um, you learn a lot from the inside of our community sport clubs. So I'm I'm learning in that role as well. So so I would consider myself a fairly applied researcher, even though obviously theoretical evolution is really important to me and it helps to frame all of my research projects. Um, the work that I do as a university researcher is really with the mindset and with the goal of making a difference in our local clubs. And if my projects can't 
at, at the end of the day, try to help move our community support system in a positive direction, then, then I don't tend to take those on. But, uh, but yeah, I'm sure I'll share a little bit more about sort of what we've been working on in, in the research space, but, but that's sort of my, my multiple hats in my story of sport. Loved it. And uh, yes, we definitely will dive more into the projects that you're all working on. But I loved, I think you're the only person that I've ever heard that says, I love it, men and theory. <laughs> but it is, right? It is the building blocks. Those are the truths. Those are the foundations. I, I share your love. Thank you so much. And Haley Baxter, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me on today's panel, Jen. Um, so similar stories to Carrie and Katie, I come from uh, a sport family. I'm uh, the youngest child. I have an older brother, so he really pushed me to get involved in sport um, at an early age. I was trying to keep up to him and do everything that he did. Um, and uh, my mom was a former varsity soccer player at University of Toronto, so she coached me growing up. So lots of, you know, special memories in that sense. Um, uh, my main sport, though, is uh, hockey. So I um, was kind of at that onset of when girls hockey really started to flourish within Canada. So I kind of lucked out in my novice year, joined an all girls um, hockey league and uh, moved my way up through community sport and then eventually had the opportunity to play varsity hockey for five years at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, and during that time, you know, I grew up actually in Waterloo, so those Laurier hockey players had been my role models, my inspiration while I was playing at a community level. So when I entered into that role at Laurier, I knew how powerful it could be when you gave back to the community and headed out to practices or ran summer camps for young females within or young girls within the community. Um, so that experience kind of led me after I was done my five years, I used up my eligibility. Um, I was, uh, after I completed my master's, I came back to Waterloo and I was actually coaching a novice C hockey team, which was a lot of fun, a great experience. I got one of my former teammates and friends to, to uh, join me um, that year to, to coach um, them in their first competitive uh, uh, time playing sport. So it was a lot of fun and it just you know, to me, uh, sport is about community, it's about families, it's about, you know, now having those sort of intergenerational experiences, like I get to live those days uh, through even Katie's kids, I'm a, a little bit involved in the dryland training with her son's hockey team. Um, and it's just, you know, a lot of fun to see sport through the eyes of youth and how invested they get in it and all of those important skill sets they learn. Um, and then those relationships that you build with parents, uh, with the youth themselves, and really just, you know, making it a more fulsome experience, being more deeply involved in the Waterloo sport community here. Um, so on top of that, I also uh, volunteer um, for a sledge hockey team out in Woolwich. So that's a great experience as well um, to have a, a different experience coaching outside of the Girls and Boys Hockey Association, more of a co-ed uh, experience with um, some para athletes. Um, so yeah, that's sort of been my coaching journey um, or my sport related journey. And then it's brought me into an interest in research within this realm. So I am uh, defended my proposal of my dissertation. It's focused on youth pathways uh, into volunteer coaching, specifically looking at female and girls, as you mentioned, Jennifer. Um, so uh, really just trying to foster that love of sport but not seeing yourself as only an athlete, but as, you know, a future leader and potential coach within those community sport volunteer spaces. Um, so thanks again for having me and I look forward to our discussion. That's so wonderful. And I'll change when we post the recording from ABD to PhD, all right? <laughs> thanks. Yeah, over, since we last saw each other, I think, wonderful. And thanks for that, you know, that beautiful, trip down your journey the path and you highlight so many elements of that experience that were so crucial like role modeling family community the structures that need to be in place hey i'm gonna start with a question i didn't that's sort of a surprise to you all but uh, you'll have answers i'm sure you think about it every day i was asked i was doing a little media the other day and the question was if you could if you were the leader of sport, the queen of sport, <laughs> and had all the resources that could do whatever you want, 
what would you put in place? What would be most important to you? Who'd like to start? I would like to hear from all of you on this one, but don't feel pressure. I don't want to go first every time, but I can. <laughs> and you go for it. Jumps right into my head. If if I had my magic wand, I would have a sports system in our country that was aligned playground to podium and that was built on a foundation of shared values and a set of principles and a set of behaviors so that everyone involved in the sport experience, whether they're a participant, a spectator, a coach, a trainer, an administrator, doesn't matter who. You know, they know what behavior is expected. They know what the experience is going to be like. It's like, a let's say, a common playbook. So regardless of the sport, regardless of the town, regardless of the size of the town, regardless of the level of competition, everybody knows what sport is and everybody has a positive experience because it's just this cohesive system that is built on a shared set of values. That's That would be my magic wand wish. And we have those shared set of values. Hello, right? True sport. I remember being, you. <laughs> uh, being at a conference and we were talking about safe sport and we kept talking about shared values. And I just kept kind of post pointing to the poster. I mean, the, the right there, all of the, yeah, it's amazing. I think it's, I think it's just the notion of consistency. You know, it doesn't matter where you go, who you play with, what level you play with, the reasons you play, that there should be kind of a shared understanding of, of what is and is not okay, what is and is not acceptable and what you can expect you know like what does it look like and and all of those pieces that is what's going to have people come to sport stay in sport enjoy sport benefit from sport and that will actually benefit our communities not just the people in sport exactly right it's not just the people participating it's good for everybody and mm -hmm. it's the most watched thing it's the most engaged in thing in our world um, well, we'll put the link to true sport, but I, I invite people to ponder those values, you know, revisit them. They were born of our country and they're right there. We just need to talk about them more and, and spread the word. How about Katie? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, <clears throat> that's the perfect answer, Carrie. I don't think we can do better than that. Yeah. And I think, it, I think honestly, it encapsulates all of the little things that my mind went to. Like I was thinking like, get rid of the financial barriers to sport. There are so many kids who cannot play because sport is now elite and exclusive and they just cannot manage to do it. And we can't find the ways, you know, despite jumpstarting kids sport and so many other organizations trying to reduce that financial barrier, it's still there and it is problematic and there are systems and, you know, that's a, that's one of those, we call them in the academic realm, we call them wicked problems that have no easy solution there, come at it from every angle. Um, and we have to sort of see that financial barrier as one of those wicked problems. Um, I think at the end of the day, we need to view, I wish that all of the people involved in the sports system would view sport with a community development lens. And what I mean by that is really just thinking about community sport and really putting the emphasis on community. What does that mean in a day-to-day -day way in terms of building culture, building leaders that value community, giving back to our communities, recognizing that people, this whole notion of this membership model, I think, you know, is even a little bit dated. And I struggle with that because I'm like, how else can we organize our community sport clubs without a membership model? But at the same time, it's very exclusive and people don't necessarily see themselves and especially people who are coming from different countries maybe don't necessarily align with that. And um, so I think there's just so many things, you know, it could start a whole snowball down the hill and, and the whole system can implode by the time we get to the bottom and maybe it should. But um, but yeah, if we could do it Carrie's way and just have that shared set of values that everybody needs to buy into, but we're also humans and, you know, we come at things with different lived experience. So I recognize too, that people do bring that and, and not, we don't always agree. Right. And sometimes that can make us better um, as groups of people who come together to care about something, but sometimes it can also tear us apart. So, you know, I think those are, those are some of the challenges, not necessarily getting to the solutions yet, but <laughs> But you're, you bet you are. It's beautiful, you know, that these values need to be invitational. We can't impose them. Otherwise, we're contradicting the whole point, right? Yeah, so yeah. How do we coalesce around these values? 
I put the link in there and invite people to have a look at those principles and, mm -hmm. you know, include everyone. And there's the, you know, we can't have financial barriers. So it seems to touch on a lot. And Haley, what do you think? Magic wand. Go. Yeah, the magic wand. Wow. <laughs> um, I agree with Katie. Carrie's uh, answer in terms of value-based support is really important. And I think, you know, Katie and I have spent a lot of time, you know, trying to reimagine what the sporting environment could look like, especially for people who are at that stage of, you know, maybe not wanting to go that traditional route that I did, where you go community competitive level onto varsity or higher level, even higher levels of sport. Um, so some of the work that, you know, Katie has led initiatives on um, uh, through a nonprofit, uh, research informed uh, nonprofit active together really focuses on um, family fitness or parent parent co-participation model of sport. And it's kind of interesting as a research assistant on the project, having conversations and giving individuals permission to reimagine what sport could look like and giving them back that power into those who are the participants of thinking about, yeah, sport doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, me just on the sidelines watching my child, but we could create these important sport environments where the whole family can participate. Um, so really rethinking this whole structure that we have where sport has to be age uh, segregated, it has to be gender segregated, and how can we create these sport experiences where people, you know, especially a lot of women we've interviewed have had really, really negative experiences within sport in the past. And, you know, we see that drop off around age 13 to 18 with girls and the more recent rally report um, that was just released a few months ago showed, you know, even um, drastic uh, after COVID drop off, as well as, you know, um, people with different identities dropping off more than, you know, say white women and uh, girls within sport. So how can we create sport experiences where we empower, you know, families, uh, individuals of all ages to say, hey, this is what I think sport could look like and then provide those opportunities for them. Love it, thank you. And, uh, you talk a bit, you know, I've heard membership models and um, these sort of assumptions we place on sport that it needs to look this way. So calling that out is great. Um, what are some of the other challenges you think are the real crux of sport right now that's making community sport and getting in the way of it, of this dream we have? And what are some of the issues? <laughs> the biggest ones. Yeah, go okay, Carrie, I'll let you off the hook. I'll go, I'll, <laughs> I'll go on this one. Well, I think, honestly, I think one of the things that sport is wrestling with right now, and this sort of aligns with sort of what we've already been talking about in true sport principles, but I think that people, and this I have seen in my own research, people want to see their own values reflected in the organizations that they choose to participate with in their leisure time. So you don't necessarily, if you have a finite amount of leisure time in your week um, and a finite amount of disposable income, you don't want to necessarily align that with something that just doesn't align with your family values, right? So I think that now people are actually scrutinizing sport organizations more than they have in the past to make sure that there is that value congruence or alignment with what their family believes in. So, and that impacts safe sport. It impacts um, whether community sport is giving back to its local community. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today because I that's one of my big research um, areas. But it also impacts, you know, what kind of people are leading that organization and what are the volunteers like in those clubs? Are they people who are caring and committed um, citizens first who 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 share those values in the way that they interact with participants both parents adults children um all kinds of different stakeholders so i think you know i sometimes say and this is you know take it for what it is but sport is the new church in a lot of ways where people see sport as this place where they align values the same way they might have thought about faith-based organizations or service organizations like Alliance Club or an Optimist Club, if you're going to give your leisure time or your volunteer time to an organization in our community, which many people do give a lot of time to sport, you want to make sure it's consistent with what you believe in. And if you believe in fairness and safety and fun and enjoyment and health, 
then you're going to look for an organization, a community sport club that aligns with those values. And some, some do, and some definitely do not, um, and are still in very much a, um, I think a former model of, <laughs> of high performance community sport that, you know, is win at all cost. And I think other organizations have really embraced that and are showing us this new model of sort of community development sport or sport for development and embodied. Um, and I think that those are the organizations that are seeing growth personally. Um, they're seeing people that are happier and more committed and more loyal to the organization. And, and so I think there's definitely some potential there that we can really grow that. So that's sort of one of the things that really sticks out to me as the crux of sport is this notion that people are scrutinizing what are the values of that organization and do they fit with my personal values yeah. and so the, the crux being a, a different set of values and you know valuing winning at all costs that, and that of course has has i think is increasingly proving to have really let us down you know so if we bought into that and thought that there was something going to a wonderful reward out of that we, we've been sort of betrayed through i think that process we're seeing more and more and the costs associated with it yeah, other other issues. Go ahead, Haley, I see you. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with Katie that obviously a lot of issues um, that are facing sport currently, but sort of my area of focus is um, obviously focused specifically on women and girls, but, you know, tons of issues related to equity deserving groups and their need to be included in sport. Um, so there are, you know, lots of systemic ba barriers that individuals face, and that could look different from one sport organization to another. So really starting to understand and unpack, you know, what exactly does, you know, inclusion um, and equity look like within your club in particular. Um, and so again, you know, Canadian Women in Sport has brought, um, you know, a few resources that can be um, used. Uh, um, I'm just looking of what the exact name so I don't get it wrong but I can pop that into the chat but just so clubs can start to unpack what it is that they're doing um, and in terms of their um, uh, inclusion and equity mm -hmm. so I think that would primarily be the issue that I would you know focus on and you know trying to get those people also into volunteer and leadership roles so not just having historically privileged groups being in those leadership roles making those decisions, but, you know, giving um, power and voice to those who, you know, want to be involved in the sports system and make a positive change for, um, for uh, all people to be involved in sport. It takes so much intentionality, right? And we think by just leaving the door open, that's going to solve the inclusion issue. And of course it isn't because there's so many other reasons why people won't step over that or can't or haven't even thought about stepping over that threshold, eh, Carrie? Mm -hmm. Precisely. So it's a lot challenging, more challenging here to go third after these two other brilliant panelists. So mm -hmm. try not to repeat what they said. But yeah, I think I think the crux of the crisis is exactly what Katie and Haley said. And just the notion that sport has to um, we need to break through the clutter. I think attraction, attracting new participants, retaining participants, all of those pieces are, are an important um issue that sport is facing right now and that is because some people as Haley just said can't get in the door they can't cross over that threshold so that's a problem others as Katie said don't like the values or you know it just doesn't align anymore I think the pandemic has taught us a lot we heard a lot about building back better post pandemic I think people realize that you know their kids don't need to be on the field of play seven days a week in order to be able to participate in a certain sport or they don't need to train 10 or 11 months of the year in a sport that's traditionally a seasonal sport. So, and, and I think the other piece is people have realized that they might not want every waking hour of their spare time spent doing one activity with one child or, or whatever the, the scenario might be. So sport has a, we need to, to show that we're a great place to come, we're a great place to be, we're a great place to stay. Um, and I think the winning at all cost mentality, although there are a lot of very well intentioned people, there is still, you know, that is still an issue within sport. I think, you know, headlines around safe sport might might frighten people away from sport who are thinking about putting their kids into sport. I'm sure we've got some, you know, some research on that in terms of, you know, harassment, abuse, bullying, even just, you know, safety issues such as concussions and whatnot. So there's all kinds of reasons. Um, for sport to need to be sort of on its toes and to 
to your last point, Jennifer, and I had just written that down on my paper, intentionality. So everything we do must be with intention um, to make sure that we're actually achieving what we set out to do. It's, you know, it's sort of like when people say, oh, I'm going to put my kid in sport because I want them to learn lifelong lessons. Well, yes, but you need to make sure the experience that they're involved in is actually going to teach the lessons you want them to learn, right? So all of those things wrapped up together, um, I think are what sport needs to be mindful of right now as we look to sort of this next wave of what sport will look like in our country. I'm often met with the rebuttal that, well, you know, sport is, is about toughening you up too, and, and it can all be, it can all be roses. And I agree, but I think there are enough, there are enough experiences that are very challenging in sport, <laughs> you know, a 2K race and a rowing boat, uh, showing up and training at 5.30 in the morning. Like, there are lots of challenging loss, you know, there's enough embedded that, that cause those character challenges, you know, we don't need to add a layer of trauma and abuse to uh, toughen someone up, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I would just say the last thing I think that, you know, is a crux of the crisis is that for the majority of our sports system at the community level, it's volunteer driven. Right. Um, and so time and time again, we hear about, you know, weak governance, right? People with, with a lack of understanding, awareness, education on what it means to be a good, uh, you know, a good fiduciary for an organization, as an example, or, you know, the leakage of like personal interest and, and you know, agendas and whatnot. So I think if we address the issue of governance and and you know the ability to train uh, the people who are the stewards of sport, we could probably mitigate a lot of the issues that emerge in sport. I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, because it really is it's the crux, right? We are, it's like education. We end up funding where the funding uh, the least where it's needed most, and we see it in sport like crazy. Why wouldn't we have really supreme coaches? working with those Timbit soccer players when they really need that foundation of skill and knowledge and the values and, and, and health and safety and all those things need to be embedded instead of it being rather random. Yeah. How, so what's getting in the way? What's getting in the way of this stuff happening? What do you think? Good governance, well-paid or well-supported or well-invested in, uh, diminished barriers, financial access and support. What's really getting in the way? pops to mind. Yep, go ahead, Hayley. I think, you know, when you mention, it just makes me laugh about, you know, why don't we have skilled coaches at the Timbits level? I always joke that, you know, I'm uh, the highest qualified coach for learn to skate, but that's really what I value as a coach is getting that experience. Like someone's first time experience is with, you know, uh, um, uh, a woman coach at with for my girls um, and that they have that positive experience. So even that you know, changing our, when we talk about having, you know, values based sport, what do the, those values look like? And are we investing in coaches at that community sport level? So they feel like they are, you know, provided with enough resources to want to stay or enough flexibility, um, or, you know, uh, just enough, you know, support dealing with parent issues, etc. There's a lot of differences to you know, coaching or volunteering within the community sport context than what you might face in higher performance sports. So, are we addressing you know the the needs of the volunteer, the needs of the the individual who's participating in community sport with what their concerns might be? Um, so that's absolutely right. And how can we not value those little kids? It just seems crazy to me that we think they wouldn't need the most resources and investment. Yeah. And start crying. So go ahead, Katie. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. The thing that strikes me about community sport that's often difficult because if I ask, you know, the the people that I work with on a daily basis who are involved in community sport and who volunteer their time, they are generally just unaware of what is going on in other sports. Like they're very focused on their individual sport, right? Hockey is so unique. We can only do it this way in hockey. And then you hear the same thing from soccer and you hear the same thing from rowing. And I think at the community level, I, I personally don't buy that. I don't think that there's that much nuance to any given sport that we couldn't have more of a system wide understanding of what is maltreatment in sport and safe sport and what are the abuse free principles that 
everyone can get behind, whether it's the responsible coaching movement or something else. Um, you know, we need some, a little bit more consistency, I think across sports, but I think it's been so ingrained and I don't know if that happens and I'm not trying to offend anybody who's more involved at the national or provincial levels, but I don't know if, you know, over time we've just adopted this, our sport is so unique. We can only do it this way in our sport that we've sort of forgotten this, that actually community sport is, is a context and it's, um, regardless of what sport you're in, that's the context really that we're talking about. And across that context, there could be so much more synergy um, through all of the sports. And, and maybe that is going to be something we're going to see in the new Canadian sport policy, a little bit more investment in that. Um, but I think, you know, I think we could be coming up with more synergies across our different sports. I think that's one of the barriers that um, that we haven't done. And I think that will serve our volunteers well, to be honest, because Typically, if you see someone who's putting their hand up coaching, you know, Haley's a great example of coaching in learn to skate, but also coaching lo local soccer. Most a lot of people sort of do that and, and have more than one sport that they're involved in. So having and they'll say, oh, in hockey, I have to do my X, Y, Z, you know, training. And then in this, I have to do NCCP level, whatever. And then, you know, it's quite confusing and it does it does just add time to their lives. But if we had a little bit more consistency across our volunteer training, um, some of those kind of bigger, higher picture principles that we want our volunteers to buy into and a little bit more system wide messaging. Um, I think that might help support our volunteers and at least create a little bit more of a um, consistent impact across that community sports sector. Instead of the clutter, right? Which mm -hmm. is confusing. And so we need that clarity. What's it going to take? What's it take to get that clarity? And you might want to all just leave your mics on and jump in as you feel, you know, that you feel that you'd like to. Um, this idea of gaining that clarity, gaining that coalescing around something that we can all agree on and uh, opening up our, our walls a little more. It's quite siloed. We're quite protectionist around our specific sports. We talked about that at that symposium we were at. Uh, it's one of the issues right over we need to be completely autonomous or we're completely unique and we can't uh, we can't relinquish any of our territory within our sport so what would it take to break down those walls a little but also everyone believing in something that's a little more common what do you think when we get there what have you seen work so far go ahead carrie um I think it goes to what Katie just said in terms of making it easy, streamlining it, you know, providing the tools and resources that local volunteers need, making it super simple. A lot of folks are like, they want to do good and they're willing to try and they're willing to, you know, entertain new ideas, but they don't have the time, they don't have the capacity. So you need to make it really, really easy to engage and really easy to execute. I think that's a key piece at the community level. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's also some work to be done. That's a that that sort of is a great point about around capacity building because I think a lot of our local sport clubs are really lacking um, strategy. That's something we've seen in our data is that that's sort of one element of their overall organizational capacity that is often lacking is the notion of planning and development and strategy. Um, they don't know how to do it, and I get asked all the time, you know, from somebody locally, "Can you help us make a strategic plan?" Um, because you know, people rotate in and off of these boards so frequently that they don't, they need a bit of a roadmap. They need to be thinking strategically about membership growth, about diversity and inclusion, about um, volunteer retention, all of these different pieces that are so important to the sustainability of an organization, but they don't know how to make a strategic plan. And um, that's a big gap at the local level is, is support for doing that and, and making sure that our board's um, can do that so that even as people come in and off of boards, there's a strategy that's going to keep them driving forward and moving in the right direction. So I've seen that as a barrier for sure. Yeah, I think one example, um, just from my own experience, so I've done some work, uh, there's a granting agency in Victoria, and I have um, some colleagues over in Australia that um, we've secured grants uh, to focus on enhancing participation pathways for female volunteer coaches. So the project really looked across three state sport organizations and um, their pathways for 
um, women trying to get involved in, in their coaching pathways. So it was neat that we were able to do workshops at the end and bring those sport organizations together to realize, you know, this is a common problem across all, you know, community level sport clubs and from the state level, um, you know, having that strategic vision to support those clubs that are primarily run by volunteers and um, what supports are actually needed for those women coaches um, through interviewing them, as well as, you know, interviewing the staff um, at the state level, as well as uh, club representative rep representatives to really understand the layers of creating change um, at the actual club level where it's affecting um, club leadership, club governance, um, and, and what that looks like at the end of the day, in this case for participants with coaching being that front facing role. And so we don't know how to create it. We don't know where to find you know, templates or examples. Carrie's just posted a beautiful resource. We've got the, uh, the Cirque resource. Rose Mercier is one of my favorite people in the world because of this, you know, she writes on it all the time. And I think, yeah, uh, those kind of templates are so valuable. There's one in the NSO Sharing Center as well for NSOs that no one uses, but, <laughs> uh, and I love your risk registry. I always like to highlight that to the NSOs. That's with the CCES. These, these resources are there. How do we help? So whose job is it to help the, how do we, you know, leverage them and get them out there? Being the communications person, I'm always looking for those little channels, opportunities. What have you seen work uh, where people go, oh, I know where to get stuff. Yeah, we're seeing Via Sport do a pretty good job in BC, but what do you think, Carrie? I just wanted to add, actually, Jennifer, on the last point that, that Katie made around the strategic plan, I think at the community level, another issue is um, evaluation. So how do they, when they implement new programs or new initiatives, how do they actually know it's working? And then connected to that is how do they communicate it with their membership? So I often find that community groups will reach out to us and say, you know, we want it, we want to do all these things, but how do we actually tell our parents why we're doing it this way? Because it's different. And sometimes there's resistance to doing things diff differently. And so I think that's another important piece where we can build capacity is to help with um, member communications and to help with some evaluation so that they can prove that the extra things they're doing or the things they're doing differently or why it's not maybe the way it's always been done uh, is actually working and serving, you know, and serving a purpose. I just wanted to add that on the last part, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's so brilliant. And then they, they feel actually that they have some meat to share with the members, right? This is, this is what we found. This is what we found in evaluating our impact. But samples are so helpful because people even struggle. I mean, being an instructor or working with organizations, that's the big question. How do you know you're having impact? And they look at you, blink, blink, right? It's, so, it's such a tough an, uh, question to answer, to generate those metrics or measures or evidence talking with leaders is the same yeah have you seen some examples of that working where uh here's kind of a model organization a model provincial association territorial association that's that's done a good job of either providing the resources samples templates communicating those uh how about community organizations that are doing a good job of tracking their impact and sharing it with members It's okay to, to not. <laughs> it just highlights that that's what we need, right? We need these uh, these exem exemplary organizations to kind of pave the way. I I know an example out of Hockey Calgary how they launched sort of this like what not to yell app initiative to try to get you know um, this like basically the premise is it's this app and you get a notification an hour before the game. Um, if you're a parent and you have this like learning module that helps you focus on emotional self-control um, or like maintaining a positive mindset or it's reminders about the league code of contact, uh, conduct. Um, so in terms of evaluation, I think they've done that in partnership with some scholars, but um, you know, mostly just marketing at this point of what the app actually does. But um, so, you know, some slight evidence that, you know, it's, it's starting to help support parents in understanding, you know, more appropriate behavior um, to, you know, what they could be yelling during a game, like good job, et cetera, supportive um, messages to youth in sport. Um, but yeah, as Carrie mentioned, evaluation is, is always a difficult one, especially for at the club level when, you know, it is voluntary, you're already, 
you know, majority of your time is going towards uh, um, you just trying to get the kids on the ice and get things done. Um, but I think it is an important uh, thing to think about and, you know, thinking about how we can partner with researchers to better improve our practice. Exactly. And I love that, you know, people, again, they think researchers are sequestered away in some little corner, but they're applied researchers like Katie and Haley here, right? Making things happen in the world. Carrie. Um, I was just going to give a shout out to a program that happens in Nova Scotia. So it's the Nova Scotia True Sport Ambassador Program. And I'm pretty sure Elena is on the call today. I think she was a guest maybe last month or something. Jennifer, yeah. one of the tapes I watched, I saw her on there. So they have done a great job of using True Sport as a way to address safe sport in their province. And so in that um, particular program where they use athletes and use a social media platform, I know they've got a, you know, a fairly rigorous evaluation and, and they track data and, you know, have a MyTax grant and stuff like that. So I feel like at the provincial level, I know of a few groups and MyTax is a great way for people to do that where they cost share, right. And get, get some research uh, behind their, behind their work. So. Thank you. And this has just been, it's always such a treasure trove of resources for people when they come on these because of you great people with so many things to share. And you can see the cross pollination that uh, these kind of forums allow as well. And I'm seeing maybe we're a bit zoomed out, but I think we've got to keep them going because it's such a wonderful way to link up our country. We're so spread out geographically. So it's a way to uh, Link us up, that's for sure, and get us sharing and breaking down those silo walls, right? Permeable walls is what we need. It's okay to have silos, they're useful. Great, what else, what else? Any other examples? We've got people, I'm, I'm welcoming the attendees to share their stories as well of things that you see working. It doesn't have to be, you know, an exemplary organization, but things that an organization has done that have demonstrated some real excellence around strategy, communication, uh, evaluation, uh, and, and consultation can be very valuable as well. Poke it in the chat or, or put your hand up. We'd love to hear about it. All right. Uh, what do you think? We've talked lots about community-based sport programming and what it has to offer as an education. I often talk about sport as a degree. You know, if you do sport, you're learning constantly. It needs to be intentional. But what do you see uh, people, the opportunities for people to learn through community sport experiences that are, you know, unique to that realm of our sport world? I don't know if this is where you're going with this question, Jen, but, but I, I want to share a little bit about what I've been seeing happening in the sector in terms of um, social responsibility. Um, this has been a piece that um, I, I've just been blown away actually by what our community sport clubs are doing in terms of caring for their local communities. And this is something that I don't think was happening. It certainly wasn't happening when I was a kid, when I was a gymnast, we were, you know, selling chocolate covered almonds outside the beer store to raise money for our next competition <laughs> somewhere okay. else. And all the money was always going back to the club and to the parents. And there's nothing wrong with that model. That definitely is still happening, right? That's basic fundraising that happens in sport. But I'm seeing this wider shift in our sport culture at the local level where clubs are really um, much more mindful of the giving back to their local communities and being ingrained in those communities. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, I'm seeing clubs that are much more environmentally conscious than we've ever seen before. They are being very careful with um you know, looking after their fields or their rivers or their different spaces that they use and having kids do garbage cleanups on a regular basis, having kids be the ones to um, look after any property sort of thing in those clubs. Um, Ultimate Frisbee is a great example. This sport is very environmentally conscious and it, I think it infuses those values. Um, I talked to a club recently as part of a project where they um, count the number of garbage bags that kids leave a tournament with, that teams leave a tournament with, and the number of cars that they carpool in. And that actually gets factored into the tournament scores. So kids are learning that sport and caring for the environment go hand in hand. And that social value is being really driven as a, instead of just an add on, it's actually like, it's going to matter because you either win or lose this tournament, partly because of how you care for the environment, which I think is revolutionary. That was not oh. happening 20 years ago. Right. So that's one example. I think we're also seeing <clears throat> our local clubs 
really caring for their communities, doing things like food drives and toy drives and um, partnering with community service agencies, partnering with, um, you know, the Can Canadian Cancer Society, doing different kinds of fundraisers. You know, I know a synchro club, a lot of actually synchro clubs have really focused on breast cancer because, you know, in um, women only sports, there's certainly, um, you know, lots of good reason to do that. So, so some alignment with social responsibility causes and doing, you know, swimming laps in a pool for a certain amount of time to raise money for cancer research, as opposed to just raising money for us to go to our next tournament or competition. So I think we're seeing that shift in lots of different ways. And I have endless examples about that. And if people want to chat more um, about that topic anytime, I'm always open to that because it's one of my, my lines of research is really trying to understand how our clubs are shifting in this social platform space and and that they're taking on these social values and wanting um our members to associate sport with doing good and with caring for others and with being committed to our community so um it's something that i'm excited about that i see happening and i think is not actually draining resources wow. people people sometimes say oh but then you're just asking your volunteers to do more that's not what we're hearing in the data we are hearing that actually people get really excited about this and usually Someone might put their hand up to organize the toy drive, who's not going to be the same person who might be the coach on the ice. So we're not asking that same person to do two things. We're actually drawing in more volunteers when we engage in some of these things, because people say, well, I can't coach, but sure, I can organize the toy drive. So um, it's actually working, I think, to support the capacity of our organizations as opposed to take away from it. Um, so I just want to share that as an example of one of the things I think that's happening in the sector that's quite exciting and has has a lot of good potential for the future and could really be expanded as we see our clubs engaging more and more. It is the thing I think, you know, because it, it feeds right back into the community and it, it's making sport an asset and, and so investing in sports so they don't have to raise money through their laps for their next tournament yeah. <laughs> that's covered, but yeah. it grows the capacity of the feedback in, right? So yeah. Sustainable model. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Bingo. Carrie. Yeah. Katie, thanks for raising that because giving back is one of the seven true sport principles. And it was a really important piece when we you know, took those four values and further articulated them into the principles. And way back in the day, we used to we used to hold something annually called the True Sport Give Back Challenge. And so we en encouraged clubs and teams to tell us what they were doing to give back. And at that time, we really had to explain exactly what we meant. Like they didn't get it. You had to give them examples. You had to, you know, to seed some ideas so that they could enter this competition to win whatever we were giving out on any given year. And and now I think, you know, we don't run that, we don't run that anymore, but you see things happening like, you know, the Chevrolet Good Deeds Cup as an example. We don't happen to have Chevrolet as a sponsor, but you know what I mean? You're seeing these things and you're seeing commercials on television and, and it just goes to the notion of the power of sport. And I think that community sport, it happens in community. The only reason it can happen in community is because the community provides the place and space for the people to come together. It provides the volunteers. It, they buy the chocolates when you come to the door. They donate their bottles when you come to the door. And so I think it's a really fabulous thing that has absolutely um, evolved. And there's such a greater understanding. I hadn't heard any stories about like, you know, accounting towards tournament points and whatnot, but I think it's really telling um, around that whole public asset piece and how sport is a community in and of itself and how the power of that little community can help a broader community. Oh, the networking, the connecting. Haley, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think when it goes back to the community, like looking at the specific needs of the community that you're in. So, you know, one example from hockey, if we're looking at, you know, the crux of the problem being, um, you know, serving equity deserving groups, um, the Seaside Hockey Group out of Scarborough does a great job of you know, it's an all black run hockey team and um, they do a great job of, you know, addressing the needs of that specific community, whether those are financial barriers, but also, you know, systemic barriers to um, black youth entering into hockey and then having being able to have role models as well as those discussions of, you know, race within hockey and, um, you know, trying to bring those conversations into other communities as well to make ensure that you know, um, hockey is inclusive of all. So, you know, Katie's, uh, the uh, community organization that um, Katie's son is part of is doing a hockey for all initiative where all of the youth are, you know, writing poems or 
um, you know, doing speeches about, you know, what hockey for all means to them. So, you know, shedding light to those initiatives and um, how we can really serve um, different communities and different community dynamics and demographics at the club level um, is also important to start to, to think through to get people involved in different sports. And describing these, capturing the value of these programs, these initiatives, adding, you know, an opportunity, giving kids an opportunity to just speak about or ask them to be accountable to speak about the power of sport for all and inclusivity is, you know, capturing the value of it, right? So now you've, you can make that argument that Spider's asking us to make here. Why would we want to host an event, a sporting event? So expensive. No, no. Yeah, yeah. You got to invest, but the returns are huge. And they're not just financial, they are financial, but there are so many other returns that you get on your investment in sport uh, with when it's done with intention. And here are all sorts of things you could use within your event hosting that could also capitalize and build capacity uh, across your community. Beautiful, beautiful. Love the statement too, forged by sport uh, instead of abuse. Isn't that great? What else can we do to share the value, capture the value of sport um, so that we can make a case for it, for investing in it. What other values does it bring to us? We're giving back. We're developing leaders. What else is it doing? I think it's just the whole package, Jennifer. You know, like with, with the focus, you know, lately or in, yes. you know, whatever, on safe sport and the absence of harassment and abuse and maltreatment, the importance of that. I think, I think what we need to think, we need to think beyond that. That is paramount. That has to happen. But the absence of harm is not good enough. You know, we need community sport to instill character. We need a community sport to strengthen our communities. We need community sport to create personal excellence. So that's your point, right? What's it going to teach? It's going to teach teamwork, collaboration, acceptance, all those all those great things that we know sport can do, or at least all of us on the call do, because we, we, we live it, we breathe it, and we love it. Um, but I think that's where we need to, to be mindful of, that we're not, you know, we're not just offering a neutral experience. We're offering a character building experience. We're not just offering experience that will prevent you from being injured, hurt, or harassed or abused. It's, that's just not good enough, right? We need to go beyond that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carrie, I think that's a, you hit the nail on the head. And I think one of the ways that, that we can demonstrate that character is in, you know, really taking a look at and encouraging the leaders that we know in community sport to take a very concrete look at the stories that we're telling as a, as a sport club um, and the culture that we're breeding. So whether it's actually a true culture audit per se, and Jen's more of an expert in this area than I am, but um, I have seen this work in a couple of clubs where they have really taken a deep dive at things like the stories that are told from year to year among coach to coach or from the board to the next, you know, what is Haley going to tell the next person who takes over to learn to skate, right? Those narratives are really important in shaping what the club is about and what the most important values are. Um, in when we look at, you know, other ways that an organization shows its culture, it might be also through our symbols, our artifacts, um, the things that people see when they come into a club. So if they walk into a local figure skating club and the first thing you walk into is this trophy case that's larger than life with photos of who's made it and who hasn't, you know, Olympians who have come from this club, that tells you a different story than when you walk in and you see photos of kids doing a toy drive or a food drive or, you know, participating in the Shepherd League Good Deeds Cup or, you know, something like that. And I'm not saying that one should happen at the exclusion of the other, but I think that we've been sort of caught in the trophy case mentality for a long time where we think that that's what excellence in community sport should look like. And that's what our culture should then represent. And I think if we start to think bigger about what our culture means, it can even mean, you know, are we advocating for having posters, you know, many of us have seen them that, that talk about, I think of the one that's in my local arena that says, you know, <laughs> these kids are not going to the Olympics. Referees are humans, you know, coaches are volunteers, you know, check yourself at the door basically, right? Like just being more mindful of the signs, the artifacts, the photos, the stories we tell, I think is a big part of demonstrating our culture to 
anyone who walks in the door, whether it's a, you know, a facility partner or the media or our own members and their families, um, but really kind of taking a scrutinizing look at that in a really critical lens on what is it that we're doing. And I think if every community sport board were to go through an exercise like that, where we scrutinize the things that are around our club that we've just left there for 30 years and never, you know, looked at all those photos of white men <laughs> on the board for 30 years. Let's take a look at that. What's it telling our new members and, and are people going to put their hand up to join the board when that's what they've seen is the history and the trajectory. So maybe we want to look at those things a little bit more carefully and um, really try to do things differently moving forward. Katie, we call you a cultural, um, a cultural deputy. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'll take right. that. In our school, we have the, we deputize everybody, and you know, as they leave the door, because now you're recognizing the power of the community culture. Yeah, everything's yeah. communicating all the time, and those yeah, those pictures of the old white guys are communicating. Um, but also that culture and governance are interlinked. So strategic planning, grounded in values, and part of the operational plan is how are we communicating these things through our priorities, but also all those artifacts, stories, etc. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, Carrie and then Haley. Yeah, just a couple of things that Katie said that jumped into my mind. Obviously, I'm not the researcher on this panel, but uh, a project that we did with Queens was something called the True Sport Principles in Action. So people said to us, you know, what, what should we expect? Like, how do we know if values-based sport is alive and well in our organization? So we did this project and it's basically what, what does it look like? What does it sound like? And what does it feel like? When, when a good sport experience is happening. So there's a series of infographics um, on our website called True Sport Principles in Action that tell you, you know, how, how will these things manifest? What can you expect to see? So that was the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, and then the second thing that popped into my mind in terms of, you know, what we see and what we hear, and, and there's so many different people who have such an important part in offering a sport experience. So a quick shout out to the gang in Manitoba for their initiative called No Ref, No Game. Right, because without the officials, we have no game. And so they did a great campaign. It goes to your notion of, you know, the signage in the arena of, you know, these people are just children, like that ref is someone's child type idea. Um, but they did a really great campaign called No Ref, No Game that, that pulls on that. And Haley. Yeah, um, so uh, one of the initiatives I know, we uh, I have a peer here um, who's at the University of Waterloo who did started off doing masculinity training with varsity athlete teams here at University of Waterloo, as well as at Laurier. Um, and basically the premise, you know, to break down an understanding of, you know, what is masculinity? Um, because I think ultimately, you know, regardless of what the issue is, like we want people to come out of sport as better people and good contributors to society. Um, and, you know, unfortunately we've seen a lot of examples in recent times of you know, people going out into a society and not being great examples of, of what stems out of sport culture. Um, so some of the research we had done sort of at the community, looking at the research that was currently at the community sport level in terms of maltreatment is that, you know, gendered abuse is, is not really something that's been that explored at the uh, community sport level. And, you know, one study in particular by Parent and Valancourt Morrill, they reported that non-heterosexual non preference was associated with higher rates of reporting sexual violence. So there's clearly, you know, we, we have wicked problems, as Katie mentioned, within the sport system. But then we do have these, these examples of, you know, whether it's this masculinity tra training, whether it's it's training on gender and sexuality from those younger ages when people are involved in the community sports system not even younger ages you know older ages as people transition and change and um there's other things going on within community sport that i think are important to sort of recognize you know what can be done not so that you know people involved in sport become better people outside of sport as well beautiful and i was chatting with uh, danielle pulos and elena lieberman the other day about this idea of prevention and, and where it starts. And we were kind of arriving at that, you know, that it begins with education of all, not just coaches, not just the leaders, but equipping the participants with an understanding of what to expect, uh, where the boundaries are, how to be a, not be a bystander, you know, get that bystander training sorted because we don't know what to do. Something happens, you kind of freeze. So how do we equip everybody with this knowledge and understanding so that right from the bottom up, which we're seeing, right, this bottom up leadership 
I don't love hierarchy, so I don't love that language, but it's what we understand. Yeah, what else could be done or is being done or what else could be done within the community support realm that could prevent some of the harms, inequities, inaccessibilities that we see right now simmering uh, across our you know, high performance layer <laughs> or corner of sport. Katie. I think there's probably so many things going on. I know there's tons of things going on that that we don't even know about or have never heard about, which is which is awesome to have these kinds of forums where you can get little glimmers of what other folks are doing. Um, one of the things Haley mentioned that that we've been involved in in Waterloo Region is starting a nonprofit where um, we're really focusing on getting parents off the sidelines and active themselves because you know, having parents stand there, and I'm sure many of you are also sport parents like Carrie and I, and, and we, you know, we spend a lot of time in our sport facilities. And it's not it's time that we're dedicating to our child sport at the expense of potentially being active ourselves. And so, you know, instead of just sitting in a lawn chair watching endless hours of kids soccer, that started to make me crazy, we started um, trying to um, it's not that I don't love watching my kids play. I do, but I also, my, I don't need to go to the rink four days a week and stand there for an hour. <laughs> I drink too much coffee. I'm on my phone too much. And I just gossip with friends. It's not, not the healthiest thing. Right. And so we've started, um, with a program that is actually offering phys intentional physical activity opportunities for parents at the same time as their kids sport. And it's been transformative. It's been beautiful to see parents being active together, creating that social capital, um, you know, really coming to the rink or coming to the field with their workout clothes on at the same time and creating this family sense of well-being and togetherness around sport where it's not all about the kids. It's actually about all of us being active and sharing in that enthusiasm for physical activity and sport for life. Um, so that's been sort of a bit of a trial program that we started during the pandemic and has has sort of taken off from there and um, also doing some swim programming where parents are coached in the pool at the same time as their daughters um, with moms and girls. And, you know, why do we always have to show up and then stand there, um, drive them there and then stand there? You know, it, we don't need to be doing these kinds of things anymore. I think we need to think really innovatively and creatively about why why we've been we've shaped youth sport to look a certain way and feel a certain way and so how do we then take those exactly like Carrie was saying take those true sport principles and blow it up a little like just experiment and I guess that would be one thing that I would encourage people to do is to not be afraid to say hey I've got an idea do you want to try this yes. and see what happens and you may not have the evaluation metrics worked out yet and you may not have a robust empirical research you know side of your organization but that's okay try something and see what the feedback is ask people what did you like what didn't you like what worked well what didn't work well and you know morph it from there and and maybe you never know where it'll go and um you know as researchers we're always open to hearing about those experiences and helping with the research side and the evaluation side from there um forming universe university partnerships in your area or your part of the country is also a really great um, way to connect because those of us that are researchers are always dying to connect with people in the field um, and hear what you're doing and give a little bit more evaluation to that. So that's just, just sort of one recent example that we've been involved in with sport parents um, and getting them a little bit more off the sidelines and into their own healthy space. Yeah, Katie, when you mentioned that, I was thinking of some of the interviews that came out where it's a good check for the parent to see, you know, when they're yelling at their kid to swim harder, or swim faster, it gives them a good reality check of how actually skilled their child is at that sport and how they can be a little bit supportive. So we had a few funny interviews where the, the parent was definitely um, saying, you know, I had a good reality check and then the kid was giving them a little bit of uh, sort of a taste of their own medicine when it came to what they were doing. And that's when that trophy case starts to weigh pretty heavily on people, hey, and then kind of cloud our vision somehow. So, so expanding our measures of sports success, sport excellence, which we've been pressuring on the podium to do, right? Expand it to include a healthy culture. Are we developing leaders? Where's your program? You know, where's the evidence? Show us. Uh, love the linking arms. Let's not forget to link arms with our institutions, our learning institutions, and let's all learn together, which reflects back to your point about evaluating how we're doing constantly uh, learning. Love it. Carrie. 
Yeah, I love the I love those stories and those examples. Another thing that pops into my mind is, um, you know, the notion of sport for de- using sport as a tool for development, and uh, in particular, the integration of newcomers. You know, so you'll see more and more programs popping up where you know they're they're doing a potluck dinner on the side of the field or whatnot, and learning about each other's cultures and all those types of pieces. So I think we all know not going to spend too much time on it because we're going to run out of time. But I think we all all can recall those stories, which are really, um, I think, important to, you know, that social fabric of, uh, of, of our community sports system. My good friend Carolyn Trono gets behind that. Haley Baxter. Go. Yeah, no, I like that you mentioned that sport for development example with newcomers just reminded me of a, a volunteer position I was part of when I was in Australia, where it was, um, a street soccer program. So it was for women um, who've perhaps, you know, experienced homelessness or, you know, come from, you know, different backgrounds uh, and how you can use sport um, and community sport to really, you know, foster connections outside of sport. So whether that's, you know, social services or health services to really support them through sport to feel, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, you're more comfortable talking to your coach than you are a medical professional and you have more time with them and you can get to know them. So that was a neat experience in terms of serving a different population through sport. And there's an opportunity within sport, right, to really highlight the power of diversity and how important it is to learn our differences and learn from each other. It's why it works. Well, that synergy is possible because of it. And the whole world, of course, hinges on it. Awesome. What else? Any questions from the from the audience, please uh, poke in and people are sharing other resources, uh, Ultimate Spirit coming out of the Ultimate Frisbee world. Wonderful to see uh, t- tackling the colonization of our world. I mean, it's still going on really. And uh, yeah, I'm loving this. This has become a real hub. And what's come to mind too is back to that point about communicating. And I remember us wrestling with this at a, I think it was a Sport for Life conference where everyone's doing a bunch of things. And and is that okay? Or should there be some kind of coordination? Should there be a hub of some sort? Tell me, is it possible? Or should we just be happy there's a lot of people doing a lot of things? What do you think? Katie, you that, for that. That, that conversation happens like at every single sport forum that any of us are in, right? <laughs> People always go like, oh, we just should all get together. And mm-hmm. I, I think I've come to realize that that is never going to happen. Um, but the more that we can at least share resources back and forth as best we can is, is a positive thing, right? So um, I appreciate, I appreciate all the things that have been shared here in the chat today and, and yeah, look forward to keeping in touch. Um as we go, you know, I think that one of the biggest things that, you know, I'm, I'm biased, I'm a management scholar. So I'm really, I'm really focused on looking at our organizations, because I think that change happens through organizations. I think that people align themselves with organizations and that as a critical mass, we can, we can do good or we can do harm. Um, And I think, you know, that focus on leadership, I think is going to be really important um, over the next 10 years, as we move into an era of real accountability in community sport and transparency um, because our national sport organizations have sort of, um, you know, really opened the door, shall I say, to a much more public discourse around um, sport governance and sport management. It was sort of a, a little bit of a niche topic, but now we are front page headlines in our amateur sports system all the time. Um, and so that has now led people to start to starting to think more about, okay, so yeah, does my money go to hockey Canada? Does my, you know, where do I align? Um, and I think that, you know, really encouraging more involvement from, um, really strong ethical leaders is going to be key as we move our governance piece forward. And governance is such a critical, huge thing in our community sports sector. You know, it's a this word that people didn't really even get. It's how our organizations are formed, how they're structured, the policies they set, and the ways that we operate. Um, and so I think, you know, trying to really uh, recruit and retain strong ethical leaders in our communities um, is going to be important and more important, I think, than any than people having technical skill in that sport. I think for a long time, we've just thought that that was what would really be the, the people that are going to be the best leaders or the people with the most technical expertise related to that sport. 
I don't think that's the case at the community level. I think it's just really important that we actually have people who are really good listeners and really good leaders. Um, and that's not an easy problem. That's actually a harder thing to train, I think, than um, the technical side of the sport. So, um, but lots of good things going on, including, yeah, some of these um, governance pieces and and building that, but they're volunteers mostly. So I think that's um, that's where the, the crux, again, it comes back to that, but, but people are committed. All of us are committed. You know, I spend a por portion of almost every day committed to um, my volunteer role. And I think because people care, about sport and about what happens in sport, we will continue to, to build better organizations if we have some tools. And back to making it easy because they are volunteers. So let's try to, uh, you know, collaborate in a way that generates some things that are common so we can know where to get them and, and that they're accessible. Um, and the truth in sport, we know this stuff from sport. We know how teams function well together and it hinges on calling people in, relying on each other's for strengths and weaknesses. I think you're also describing the shift we're calling for in, in coaching, leadership, governance, is to be, yes, uh, more of a facilitative servant leader, values-based mm -hmm. leader, uh, thinking of yourself in service rather than in dominance, mm -hmm. <laughs> power mm -hmm. to rather than power over. Yeah, for uh, sure. And the cultural, like having the understanding of how culture actually works and that alignment is crucial. Hey, how do we uh, make sure we're equipping our, all our leaders with that? And again, lots of people working on it, but it would be good if we could coordinate a little bit more, which is my agenda with this. Okay, Carrie. Yeah, I would say um, exactly that building on, on your comments, Jennifer, and, and the piece that Katie shared. I think that it's not the job of one person or one organization or one institution. You know, many hands may like, make light work, but at the same time, um, you know, certain groups are well positioned to lead certain areas. Uh, there is a desire for leadership. I know when we did the 2018 Values Proposition Symposium roundtables across the country, the sector said, you know, Somebody has to be the network leader of values-based sport. And for those of you who know true sport for a long time, we tried to lead from behind forever. And CCS's newest strategic plan has true sport as one of the strategic pillars, which is so exciting because I can sit here and say, I work for the CCS and I'm talking about true sport because it's, it, you know, we're leading from the front now, which is great. Um, but I think too, that there's, there's, there's a place for everyone to contribute like there's so much to be done and so much good to be done so there's places for everyone to contribute and although a lot of folks in sport are competitive by nature just by the virtue of finding ourselves here it's it's important to you know to be aligned and to not reinvent the wheel and to really build synergy and so having conversations like this are fabulous because um even though i've done this for 25 years i've learned so many things just watching that that chat pop up i'll look forward to actually reviewing the chat in detail when i'm not thinking about the next thing I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. People are care. People are well positioned. Um, I always think of rowing. When people talk about emergent leadership, rowing's a lot like that. You've got a coxie who's steering it, but that's not the only leader. There's someone setting the pace, but she relies on the person behind her. And people in the back have to be incredibly technical. And there's just constant communication and sharing. And yeah, the coach is the leader, but then they launch you and they can do nothing. So, you know, you really, it's very emergent and that's our world. If we could just learn from sport a little more, it'd be great. <laughs> what is that? That's just my kind of private question for everybody. Why can't we take what we know from sport and translate it into organizations? I feel like there's this strong wall that prevents the learning from really taking hold in leadership domain of, a, of an organization in sport, even sport organizations, they struggle and want to be very hierarchical instead of partnered. And interesting to ponder. Let's ponder that one. Let's talk after Katie with a cup of coffee. <laughs> All right. Um, any last questions from the from the gang here? Appreciate everybody hanging in. It's a, we go for an hour and a half and I'm glad we do because I feel like we we'd be crunched if we try to cram it into an hour. But any last words from our panelists or last questions? Go ahead, Katie. No, I just want to thank everybody for coming because I know people are coming at this from different um, viewpoints. And, you know, sometimes you're probably thinking, oh, I know, I know a better example than that. And, and which is so true because these are people who are experts in our field and people who care a lot and give a lot of time to our different sports systems and organizations. And many are volunteers probably, and some are in paid roles with sport organizations, but 
you know, when we, when we come together to think deeply about the things that we care about and try to make the sport experience um, more healthy and more balanced and more inclusive um, across Canada, I think we're all better off. So I just really um, say thanks to the people who are watching and coming to lean in um, to the system, because I think, you know, I think, you know, even if it's a little bit, little, little by little, um, there's possibility for a system transformation if we get good folks involved. So yeah, thanks for everybody for coming today. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having us, Jen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. What a, what a privilege. And Haley, go ahead. Yeah, much appreciated to uh, have us today. It's been um, great uh, discussing this topic. And I see Clarence's comment. Yes, it's volunteering. However, if you're not doing it from the heart, then you shouldn't get involved in the first place. And I feel like there's definitely a lot of heart on this panel and within, you know, all the individuals who've come today um, and thinking about too, like, how can we create that same heart and that change in the next generation? And how do we, you know, foster those positive youth development experiences to foster the next generation of community sport leaders and sport leaders across our country? So, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly an exciting and broad topic, uh, but um, I think, uh, you know, I think community smart is where it all starts for people. And um, that's why I think, you know, I can speak for myself and maybe a little bit for Katie. That's why where a lot of the passion comes from is, you know, those are those initial experiences a lot of times where, um, you know, people develop that love of, of sport and all it can, can give. So thanks again, Jen, for having me and um, thank you to everyone who's come today. Thanks for coming. And Carrie, I keep picturing us. When I was a kid, I used to have to sing the God Save the Queen and Say the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of every day. I'm 100. And wouldn't it be great if we would recite the, the principles, the true sport principles before a game starts? You know, the whole uh, rugby games, they sing Sweet Caroline. But what about the true sport principles? It would be wonderful. How can well, I keep you? Let you us know. In, uh, if you take in the Canada games, which I think start next week, they do do true sport oaths at the beginning of the games. The coaches, the spectators, and the athletes all say a different true sport oath at the opening ceremony. So there's an example where you can catch it in action. But yeah, I would just say like Haley and Katie, it's absolutely a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Uh, I think it's more and more conversations like this that we need. And I would just go back to, I think, where I started of, you know, sport is a valuable public asset. We need well-intentioned, passionate people to shepherd and to nurture um, this asset. And, and building on what Haley said, um, almost everyone starts their sport in community sport. And unfortunately for some people, that's where sport ends as well. So, you know, a community sport is this place where no matter how long someone stays, or they may stay there for, you know, sport for life at, at any age or stage, but it's always happening in the community. So I think it is something that we need to cherish, that we need to nurture, um, and that there's so much good in it. Uh, a few tweaks here and there, a little bit of alignment, the odd magic wand, and we can probably make wonderful things happen. Beautiful way to finish and thank you all. Yes, loved it. Love seeing everybody and all these familiar names and let's keep linking arms and working together on building a positive sport future. Thanks to my panelists. We'll see you next time. And Amara has shared the link for the next one already. <laughs> there are lots of connections between what we were talking about today and next month. So I'll also be to Spider from the Northwest Territories. I will also be uh, interviewing Laura Meisner, you probably know, and um, David Legg from Calgary. And we're going to be talking about hosting and the power of hosting events and very similar. I think I'm gonna bring in all sorts of threads from today to that one again. We'll post that as a recording. Take care. Thanks, everybody.